welcome back folks to the JPS podcast and it's been a minute since I've released the podcast but I'm very excited to be back into a more regular regime and looking forward to getting plenty more content on the podcast out to you all. So in this episode I have Brandon Roberts and we are talking about muscle biology and response heterogeneity. So we talk about muscle biology, what it is, the mechanisms of hypertrophy, and individual variation in response to training and diets. So those of you who don't know who Brendan is, he's a researcher specifically interested in the role of ribosome biogenesis during resistance training. And he's a science-based writer and content provider, and he is a coach at the Strength Guys. So very, very intelligent. Uh, but also hands-on guy. He's a competitive athlete himself. He competed just this year in bodybuilding and did really well from what I can see. So before we get into things, a bit of housekeeping. Our online mentorship course for personal trainers and learned lifters uh, is kicking off in 2020. We have over 50 hours of content and growing in the mentorship with presentations from the likes of Mike Isretel, James Krieger, Danny Lennon, Brian Miner, the 3DMJ crew, Revive Stronger, myself and the JPS guys, and plenty more. Included in the mentorship course is our physique contest prep course, a rehab and movement course. Our students also get subscriptions to monthly applications in strength sports, aka mass, and James Krieger's weightology research review. We also have monthly Q&As, an online network of coaches and support from our course lecturers. Our students also get access to all of our templates and more. So it's jam-packed with not only content, but support and guidance along the way to ensure that you are raising the standard of your practice. So if you're a coach and you want to upskill in 2020, check the description box below because early bird enrollment is open and you can save big and enroll in the course for less than 1600 Australian dollars with flexible payment options available. Also, just to let you guys know, in 2020, we are releasing our Powerlifting Fundamentals course, which is an online course for strength coaches and athletes, and specifically those interested in preparing uh, powerlifters. So this is coming out in early 2020, uh, so make sure that you stay tuned for details on that. The Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference is back in action in July next year, the 10th to the 12th, and this is undoubtedly the biggest fitness conference uh, in the world, and we have 10 presenters lined up to present over three days. I can't give you too much uh, details as to who is coming and presenting at this year's conference, but I guarantee you it will not disappoint. And early bird tickets are on sale. Link in the description box below to be a part of this epic event. Also, if you're looking for in-person and online coaching from coaches who have the knowledge and experience to help guide you towards your goals, the JPS team are accepting in-person and online clients uh, for a limited time only until January 2020, and then we are going to restrict uh, positions from then. So if you want to work with one of our coaches, be sure to check the link uh, below and apply now to book your consultation and start working towards your goals in a more efficacious and effective manner. Also, if you aren't able to afford online coaching or in-person coaching with us, you can join our online fat loss program, The 10 Weeks to Lean, which has had nearly a thousand participants over the course of five years and has proven time and time again to help people not only learn the fundamentals of nutrition, but to apply the principles of fat loss immediately and get insane results. And that is starting in January. And it's a very, very cheap and affordable way to work with us and have uh, a team of coaches take care of your diet and training for the 10 week program. So check that out if you are looking to get leaner in the new year and wanting to work with us at a more uh, cost effective rate. And finally, if you can't afford that uh, and everything else fails, you can download one of our training templates online. Uh, we have a male and female specialization template, an arm specialization template, and a booty glute program uh, that is available and they're only uh, they're less than 30 Australian dollars. So get your hands on one of those if you are wanting to work with us. So without further ado, I introduce to you Mr. Brandon Roberts. All right, Brandon. So welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you very much for coming on. We've had multiple scheduling issues, so I appreciate you uh, bearing with me. 
And for the listeners who may not be familiar with Brandon, he is a competitive uh, physique athlete, uh, powerlifter, I believe. Have you competed in powerlifting? Um, you co- you no, coach, not you for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely coach him. I, th- I definitely saw somewhere that you had competed in powerlifting. Um, and he's a muscle biologist. So we're going to be talking all about that today. So firstly, Brandon, do you want to explain to the listeners what muscle biology involves? So at what level are you looking at the muscle? Because I'm sure many people are going to be thinking about biology. They're going to think back to year 10 when they had to you know, memorize all the, you know, functions of the cell and all these sorts of things. So uh, do you want to explain to listeners what you do? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, when I, I can remember sitting in one of my first biology classes and, you know, you have the organisms and then you have cells and you have kind of all this interacting together which a lot of people um, forget, but what I have kind of specialized in um, is looking at the muscle cell itself. Um, And you can, like, cells, muscle cells are some of the biggest in the body. Like a muscle cell has multiple nuclei. It's really special in the fact that um, it can adapt to pretty much anything. So, like, if you think about the, the... biology of other organisms if you if your heart shrinks too much you probably die if your lungs have a hole in them you probably are in trouble too um but muscle if you think about kind of breaking your arm right so you you break your arm you're casted for like six to eight weeks or whatever it is um so your muscle will shrink during that time period but then afterwards i mean it pretty much takes a while but it gets back to normal um so i think that's the the really cool thing about muscle is it's just ability to regenerate adapt to whatever's around it or whatever's happening um but yeah so i basically look at muscle biology on a more cellular level like inside the muscle cell awesome and uh something that you uh, presented on uh for the jps mentorship was uh response heterogeneity and you looked at how different people uh, respond differently to resistance training. So do you want to quickly touch on what is happening at the cell or what differences there are um, from a genetic standpoint uh, that can influence this uh, response we have to training? Because we know that some people, uh, they brush their teeth and they just blow up and get absolutely jacked. And then there are other people who really grind it out for years on end. They're very meticulous with their training and it's just like watching grass grow. So what's happening at the cellular level when we see variance in how people grow? Yeah, so that is that is the kind of penultimate question because we have some ideas um, and we're not really sure uh, in other areas. So some of the ways, and I'll kind of just give a brief overview of some of the ways we look at it first, just obviously we have to have some muscle um, and say we have people who respond really well and we have some people who don't respond well. Well, you know, we have to do a lot of these studies kind of after the fact, right? We're, we don't know who's going to respond well up front. Um, so then you have to, A, determine, you know, what what is a responder? Um, is, is that like someone who gains 20% muscle size or like 3% or 5%? So that, that's kind of one of the limiting factors. But um, once you do set your kind of threshold, um, you can start to look in the cell. And what we've seen in muscle is those who have more satellite cells. So satellite cells sit on the kind of periphery of the muscle. And then when you need to grow or repair, or regenerate, they kind of fuse in and allow the muscle to to grow out. Um, so people with more satellite cells, it seems like grow better, right? Um, so that's that's one way you might be a, a responder is if you have more satellite cells for some reason, whether that's, um, you know, we want to speculate, maybe you are on kind of testosterone or something and you get a boost or some other kind of hormone, or maybe you're just genetically gifted. Um, so that's one thing that I think is the most supported thing um, if we go on to other things, uh, something that I studied for the past couple years are, um, ribosomes. So ribosomes are in muscle cells. They're responsible for creating proteins. Uh, we know muscle protein synthesis kind of increases after exercise or with protein. Uh, and it's really important. Like 
if, if you don't have muscle protein synthesis, you wouldn't grow. Um, so there's an idea, and I think there's a good little bit of evidence to show um, maybe if you have more ribosomes for some reason, um, you grow better because you have higher levels of muscle protein synthesis. So that's, that's probably two of the most supported um, theories. I think another big one that's kind of coming out is uh, capillary density. So if you have the ability to either adapt and create more capillaries, more blood flow, or if you just have more capillaries to start with, you may be able to grow better. Um, so th those are the kind of the big three, I think, for right now. Fantastic. And do you want to run through uh, some of the really uh, interesting findings? Uh, you know, there's been cases where they've put people in the same program. Some people grow tremendously and others actually regress. So uh, do you want to explain to listeners uh, why that is and, uh, yeah, what could be contributing to that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we have we have an, a lot of factors here. Um, and I'll start with uh, – Kind of, we'll, we'll just use strength because it's easier. When you look at a lot of the strength measurements, almost ever everybody gets stronger, and so that would make you think, pending injury or some pull or something else, that okay, I'm getting stronger. That's great. I should probably get bigger with that. And we've known for a long time that there's a neural component to strength, so it's like okay, maybe maybe not. Maybe I won't, I won't get bigger, but I'll get stronger. So um, most people get stronger is basically what I'm saying, unless something happens. Now, when we look, look at hypertrophy, we see this huge range, like depending on the measurement style, um, depending on the protocol, right? You can see some people who will go negative. So maybe they lose 5 to 10% of muscle size, however that's measured. And then there are some people, and we would call those like low responders or whatnot. And there are some people who respond really well, and maybe they grow 30%. Um, and those would be your high responders. Um, now, uh, going back to the stuff I mentioned earlier, some of those high responders have more satellite cells, more ribosomes, things like that. Um, but I think the broad range, like you mentioned, is is important, especially from a from an athlete or a coaching perspective. Like you may have athletes that just don't grow that well. Um, so I think that's important to see. And that one of my favorite studies that really brings this together is a Tinian 2016, where they have like almost 300 people and, and you see this beautiful waterfall graph where it's just like negative 10 to positive 30. Um, so I, I think that's a, a good starting point if anybody wanted to read about it. But yeah, that, that's wide range, like you said. And when it comes to what's causing muscle growth, uh, I think this is an area a lot of the listeners will be familiar with. They'll uh, most likely have heard of the terms mechanical tension, metabolic stress, muscle damage, uh, and hopefully be up to speed with those. So where is the literature at? at the moment um you're obviously right into this field uh it seems that uh, mechanical tension is a big player do you want to discuss that first um and then we can go into uh, the other two and clear up some misconceptions potentially around those yeah sure for sure um so i think right now and and i don't it would take a good bit of data to kind of change my mind but as a scientist i'm always kind of open to being wrong um Mechanical tension or weight on the bar seems to be the driver, right? And when we think about, okay, well, if that's the driver, that means that I'm getting more myofibular proteins, um, at least in the beginning of training, uh, where I can you know, have more myosin and actin interacting, it makes me stronger, hence the strength gains with the neural component too. Um, so that's kind of what we think is um, leading this, this muscle growth is, hey, I'm lifting, I'm adapting, I'm pushing myself. I need more myofibular proteins to, so that I can lift more weight. Um, so that's the, the basic. And that's, you know, for the most part, what I would say is correct. 
Awesome. And uh, is there any other pathways that uh, can create this mechanical tension? Uh, do we need to, you know, just have a certain intensity threshold as weight on the bar, or is, uh, you know, mechanical tension something that we can achieve, um, you know, through accumulating fatigue? Do you want to sort of explain? Um, yeah, the, the different ways that we can achieve mechanical tension and what this then um, will look like in terms of progressive overload in training, I guess, if we can uh, target that mechanism. Yeah, yeah. So I like to relate this back to people in the gym who you go in the gym, people are doing the same weights every day. They're not changing size. Um, and it might be because they're not getting fatigued, right? They're not taxing themselves. Uh, it's really easy to to not put weight on the bar. It, it's you know to grow it actually takes effort. Um, so when we and I haven't done so I, so I have not honestly gone into this. So I'm kind of hesitant to talk about it, but it you know is a hot topic. Um, the kind of effective reps idea, right? Where it's like the last three to five reps or whatever is where the growth that's occurs, um, and that's because. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just, we'll just kind of tangentially go. But, um, you know, I think that is important because if you're stopping at RPE 6 or something, um, you're not necessarily getting that adaptive stress, right? So your body adapts to stress, muscle adapts to stress really well. And if you're not getting that stress, then there's no reason for it to change. Um, so, so I think just if you think more practically, um, you know, if you're not stressing, you're, you're not going to change. Uh, now, mechanistically, we will see very similar responses, and nobody's done this study yet. Um, but if you took, like, trained people and you said, all right, well, I know, I know muscle protein synthesis is important. Now, let's take some people and train them for, like, I don't know, 12 weeks or something. And let's have half of them go like kind of RPE six, seven, and half of them go RPE nine or to failure even. Well, you know, what's, what, what do we think is going to happen? And I would hypothesize, right, that the people who are training harder with higher intensity, no matter really the rep range, because we know that doesn't seem to matter as much um, based on Schoenfeld's and others' work, um, that we would say, hey, you know, the people who are working harder are probably going to grow better as long as they're not um, overtraining, which I don't, I don't even think you'd have to worry about in a 12 week study. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how I like to think about it. Uh, do you have any kind of questions based off that kind of response? Yeah, no, 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 that, that was good. Uh, so let's dive into metabolic stress. What is the go here? Because I think uh, when uh, we had a lot of the you know, higher ups in the evidence-based movements start to really pump mechanical tension and downplay the role of uh, metabolic stress. I think people were uh, very quick to throw the baby out with the bathwater and, you know, just dismiss metabolic stress altogether. Um, so where is the research at at the moment and what's your interpretation? Yeah, yeah. So so when we think about metabolic stress, um, when mechanical and I think this is actually is what what's happening, but we this is like at the infancy of research. Um, and this is a, a paper by uh, Cody Hahn, who is awesome, and you should go read it. But I wrote about it on my Medium article or my Medium blog. But this idea that you know, okay, if we've got this mechanical attention and we're looking at myofibular proteins, there's this other component of maybe we like to call it sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Maybe that's driven by some metabolic stress where, so maybe I am doing the same weight, like it only increased weights, and I'm just hitting more reps, right? So technically my volume load is increasing, but it's not really that mechanical tension aspect per se, exactly. Um, still progressing, but not directly through the tension. Um, so maybe there's some other adaptations that your body adapts to because of the um, increase in reactive ox oxygen species, which are kind of components of creating energy that just bounce around the cell and, and kind of tear things up. Um, so we need to adapt to that. Um, we're also, as bodybuilders, right, we're doing a lot of reps, so we need to be able to have the mitochondria to power 
kind of the energy that we're using. So maybe maybe the mitochondria expand, and that's part of it. So basically, um, the metabolic stress aspect could be independent, but also coupled a little bit with the mechanical tension aspect. And I think people get lost here, right? Because we know that if you look at the BFR literature, if you have someone and you you know wrap up their arm and you do BFR, it it works. It works in old people, it works in young people, it works in diseased people, it works in pretty much everybody um, to an extent. So I don't I don't know if um, there's been enough in that area to really tease out the differences, but I would be hesitant to throw out the metabolic stress aspect. I just don't think we know enough to describe like exactly what's going on and how it's important and, and even like how it's necessarily that different from doing something that's not as stressful metabolically. Cool. And uh, I guess that is the case with a lot of the hypertrophy research, right? Is that uh, we still are uh, learning a lot about uh, what it takes to build muscle and uh, we can't, yeah, hang our hat on anything uh, just yet. So uh, when it comes to muscle damage, uh, there's a lot of people who still think that you have to break the muscle down and it builds itself back, back up and that's how uh, it grows. So is muscle damage uh, causative of growth? Is it uh, correlative with growth? What are your interpretations of the research at the moment and where are things at? Yeah, so so this is kind of, again, like you said, fallen to the, the wayside um, a little bit. And I, and I think people almost overinterpret this, this idea because – you're, you're not necessarily tearing muscle down to build it back up, but you are, in fact, like part of building muscle is breaking down those proteins, going through muscle protein uh, degradation, and then synthesis kicks in, and you need to remake those. Um, but it's not as simple as you know, most people say. So I think it's, it's a component. It's maybe not something that we want to strive for. Um, it, it is related to growth, right? If we look at, um, I think the one study was the Dama study. Um, I tried to say, you know, it may not be muscle damage, may not be indicative of growth, but when we have untrained people or even trained people, and we and we throw massive amounts of volume at them, we can we can cause muscle damage very easily, right? And they'll probably still grow. Um, now, the recovery aspect is what we need to, to focus on because people get trapped. They're like, oh, I need, I need muscle damage to grow, so I need to just high intensity, high volume all the time. Right? And that's, I mean, it'll work. That's not the best method, and it'll only work for so long. Um, so I'm really hesitant on that one because I think that has the least amount of data, the, the muscle damage stuff. Um, and when you go into the muscle cell, right? So if we go back to our muscle biology, I need a piece of muscle tissue, let's say from your leg to analyze. Well, well when I put my needle in your leg, I cause muscle damage, right? So it's, it's a little bit harder to understand what's going on if I'm causing damage just by getting a sample um so then we have to look at indirect things maybe something in the blood right so maybe like creatine kinase is a good in indicator of um muscle damage so we could we correlate that with growth and maybe that doesn't correlate as well but again this the idea that muscle damage is is not important i think is a, is a little bit of a stretch i just don't want people aiming for to to get doms and, and muscle damage Awesome. So we shouldn't be uh, aiming for soreness. And when in a program, can people expect to be sore? And what are the things that, uh, two part question. So what are the things in training that cause muscle damage or we know will cause muscle damage? And when should they be feeling sore? Because soreness is something that uh, people experience in their training. Uh, and I guess there's certain times where feeling a little bit sore is good, where more soreness can be expected and less soreness, so on and so forth. So do you want to just tease out uh, the, the really practical stuff for the listeners? Yeah, yeah. So I think anytime we start a new type of program, uh, muscle soreness is okay. It, that, that could be new new rep ranges, 
new exercises, especially, I think if you go, so say you haven't squatted for a while and you go back and squat, like you're, you're going to be sore. Um, and, and all of that is okay. I think the transition between, um, exercises or phases, even maybe you're going from a high volume phase or a low volume phase to a high volume phase. So you're just doing more work and your body's like, ah, that's, that's sore. Um, that's okay for a couple days for a period. I remember back, oh man, this is a while ago, but I would only do legs like once a week. And, and it was like every week I was sore for like four to five days. But then as soon as I started doing legs twice a week, um, and this was probably like 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the soreness went away. And so I see that a lot in my athletes and my clients who are on a typical like bodybuilder split and then I'll put them on an upper lower uh, push pull legs type thing. Um, and so I'm like, soreness is okay. You can actually train through soreness and there's no detriment to it. it it'll suck <laughs> to like do, but it, it's okay. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just my, my holistic thoughts. It's, it, it's good when transitioning, but not good to always be sore. I guess uh, novelty plays plays a big role in that, and when people introduce new exercises that they haven't done for a while, or returning from a layoff, or maybe they do more uh, yeah. essential training, that's when uh, they can definitely feel uh, the DOMS, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I guess moving on from this, what I wanted to talk to you about was uh, something that I heard you discuss on the Revive Stronger podcast. And guys, if you haven't checked that out, make sure you do. It was a really good uh, interview. But what I wanted to ask you about, which you spoke with Steve on, was this whole idea of muscle density or muscle maturity, mm. where uh, you know, as bodybuilders, we see these uh, competitors as they get older and older, uh, they just have a a different look to the young guys when they come on stage you know they're, they're just looking different there's something about the way their muscles are holding themselves together uh for lack of a better word uh than the young guys who yeah just don't seem to hold on to as much size or density and they are looking you know less mature i guess in their muscles so what do you think is the cause for that? Obviously, I heard you speak about it on the Revive Stronger podcast, but if you've got any further ideas uh, that you'd like to explore. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so so I, I, I have noticed this, and even in myself as I've kind of like aged up is, you know, there, this density thing, is there's something there. We just don't know what it is. Um, and I think it, there's a possibility that, there's there's more maybe myofibular protein in kind of these muscles where maybe if you look at muscle there's um, mitochondrial there's there's intramuscular lipids there's glycogen so you have all of these components so maybe the components have changed to make it look different um, and I don't I cannot think of any studies who have even tried to really look at that. Um, there's one, a super old one, I think it's from the 70s, that I did mention on that that other podcast where it, it looks like the packing density, so the fibers actually just get closer together, which would kind of lead us to speculate, oh, well, maybe younger people, just as an example, have more fat between their muscle cells, maybe. Um, maybe they hold glycogen um, between their muscle cells a little more so that they actually look bigger, but they're not as dense. So maybe if it's within the muscle, like the actual cell, it looks better or something. Um, so so I, I'm not sure. We definitely don't have any. This is like me purely speculating. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what we would have to do to figure out what, what's causing that. Um, and there... Yeah, so I don't I don't have much beyond that other than pulling some biopsies from some uh, uh, elite bodybuilders and some like younger elite or non elite bodybuilders and saying, hey, let's look at this. But when we when we do pull those biopsies, right? So we go in the leg, pull out the muscle. We look at kind of a circular area, so we can see how big their fibers are, right? Um, but inherent to the kind of uh, technique 
is all of the plugs, is what we call them, or biopsies that we get are going to be different sizes. So you could get one that's like this big, or you could get one that's like this big. And so when you go to compare like fibers within that size, maybe a good way to look at it is to say, hey, you know, this is the number of fibers per area. Um, we have to normalize to the, the plug or the, the sample. But, it, you know, that looks like we could do that. So, you know, just some kind of ideas of how we could get at that question. But nobody's nobody's really done anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine there'd be too much interest in looking into the yeah differences in like elites and sub elite bodybuilder fiber types um yeah at this point especially when we have more uh, pressing matters such as uh obesity and other public health concerns uh so that's uh, really really interesting do you think that there is something going on independent of the actual packing of the microfibers do you think that there's something that comes with just training for a longer period of time and also better managing yourself during contest prep and potentially retaining more muscle? Do you think that's a, a reason that competitors just look better and better over the years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I, I look back to my first competition and I definitely lost some some muscle along the way, mm -hmm. at least visually. Um, so I, I think that's a big aspect to it. It might just be that these guys know how to, guys and girls know how to diet better. Um, so they're, they're retaining size in the right compartments within the muscle and they're doing it slower generally. So like if you look at, you know, people who are doing 50 week preps, like that's kind of the norm now is just like a huge prep, um, with lots of kind of intermittent diet breaks and stuff. Nobody even knows like, what does a diet break do to the muscle? We, I don't know. I know it fills up with glycogen, but outside of that i don't know if that maybe that's how some people look better is these these elite bodybuilders or you know higher level bodybuilders just know how to diet better so they look better long term um so there may also be just to go ahead and speculate even more there may be some like water adaptations that are happening um because so there's some proteins called aquaporins that I have a slight interest in, but they regulate the water movement in and out of the muscle cell. And so maybe the um, the fact that we diet down and come back gives those proteins, and with some water manipulation, some ability to adapt, right? Yeah. So maybe there's some kind of like fine level adaptation there that we're just not aware of. Um, but you're right. It's, it's kind of like, I could look at that or I could look at, how to help people with obesity and stuff. And, and oh, people only want to study certain things, but, and I totally understand it. So, but yeah, that's a good observation for sure. Awesome. And I guess something else that you're very, very interested in, in terms of individual variance in how people respond to training exercise and uh, diet in general, which you covered in uh, the lecture you completed on the topic for the mentorship. Um, but I was really, really interested in how people respond to overfeeding. And this goes both ways. People respond differently to both overfeeding as well as restricting calories. So how does this play out in practice? Do you want to discuss that a little bit? And then if we could tie that into the whole competitive discussion and how people get better and better over time. Do you think that there's anything going on in terms of the uh, settling point theory? Are people changing their settling point and thus, uh, you know, as they diet down, they're just not getting as far away from that initial point when they first competed, meaning that uh, they don't have to risk, uh, you know, losing muscle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I have um, briefly kind of, I touched on a little bit in my um, lecture, but this idea that we have a two types of people ish if we're going to categorize them. we have kind of those thrifty people who have this metabolism that we call diet resistant right and so what they do is you put them on a diet so in competitors say like you put your athlete on a diet and they start losing weight for a little bit and then they just kind of stall and so you've got to add in daily steps or more cardio just because they're they're neat right their movement has dropped so much um now there is an aspect of metabolic adaptation right we kind of know that it 
bottoms out around 15% where your metabolism will drop, but you know, at most 15% more than we would expect it to. Um, but we don't know the differences in between kind of the individuals of actually nobody's really looked at that. Um, where, you know, if the max is 15%, do we have some people who go like two to 3% and some people who are, are like pushing that 15%. Um, and then on the other side, kind of, we have the hard gainers who you feed them and they just move. They're just moving their metabolism upregulates a little bit. Um, and so it makes it really hard to gain weight. Now, I think when we talk about people who are competing and the difference between beginners and, and later stage people is, uh, the good bodybuilders know that's going to happen, right? So they will go out of their way and kind of prevent it by doing more chores or walking further, you know, to the grocery store or, you know, doing little things that add up over time, especially over, you know, like a half year or more longer prep that'll make that difference. And I think that's the biggest difference I've noticed even myself um, as I've gone through years of bodybuilding is it's like, all right, I know I'm going to stall around this weight. So I'm going to offer to, you know, run to the store more than normal or kind of bike more or walk to work or something. Um, so I think that's how we apply that, that in now the, the settling point, And I actually just thought of this as we're speaking, um, bodybuilders or even general athletes over time are increasing their muscle mass, right? Hopefully if they're doing it right, even if it's slow, it's like maybe like a pound or two a year at the later stages. Now, as you're increasing this, you're competing and you dive down and then you come back up and your new set point is kind of where it was. But now years later, you've put on more muscle mass. So it may be that you look better because you have more muscle, less fat each time you compete, right? I, I don't know that the settling point theory, I don't know a, a lot about it. Um, and I think there's a lot of big brain component to it, but from more of a practical sense, it's like, oh no, bodybuilders, like one of the things they love to show is I look better at the same weight. It's like, exactly. Hopefully you do because you've gained more muscle. So that's kind of the, just the, the practical side of it. Yeah, no, awesome. And I think that explains a lot of the importance changes that we need to be making uh, over the years is we want to be building muscle and obviously making that process of uh, getting leaner easier and easier each time. So I guess it'd be interesting to see if people are able to move along that spectrum of thrifty to spend thrift over time, whether it was, yeah, as you mentioned, more of a, you know, top down kind of uh, change where they just get better at modifying their uh, behaviors and environments and, and those sorts of things, which changes their weight and then they adapt to that. But uh, very interesting stuff. Brandon, what are you up to at the moment? I know you have just started a couple of little projects with the strength guys. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we, uh, we just started a online journal club, which I'm hoping – some of your uh, your, yeah. your people in your mentorship program will will really enjoy, and I think they will. The goal of that the goal of that is to I usually put up a poll, or if somebody else wants to present, I'll just let them pick the paper. Um, but to help people understand how to break down research, right? If you're not trained traditionally, um, you can do it easily. Like lots of people do it without PhDs. It's a, it just takes a lot longer. And so what I found over the, over the past three to five years is I run these journal clubs in person. And some of the students are like highly involved and they're like, you know, they get to pick the paper and they're excited about it. And some are kind of like, eh, uh, not my topic. So hopefully we take that aspect out because it's focused on exercise and nutrition and, and things we care about. Um, and so that was my first step was get involved in it because it's like, oh, that study is applicable to me. I care. Let me listen or watch or comment. Um, but basically what we do is that I'll post up kind of the article after we pick it uh, for a couple days, maybe like three to four days. Um, let people kind of read it, give them a little while, ask some questions, and, uh, and ask people not to answer those questions. I'm just like, just let it be. 
Um, it's hard not to answer questions, especially some of the kind of easier ones, but it's really important to just think, let, let it marinate the, the science and the reading. Um, and then we go Facebook live, I think is what we're going to stick with from now on. Um, is, it, is I try to make it conversational where I answer those questions. I give a breakdown of the research. I say, you know, this is probably why they did that. Or this is, this might be why they did that. Or like, I don't know why they did that. That's, that's silly. Um, but I, but I really want to kind of show people that science and, and one paper is just a little block, right? It's like, all right, incremental increases, um, kind of like the progressive overload, right? You just want to get like five pounds. You're happy with it. Um, so, so we are next week will be our fourth, I think our third or fourth meeting. Um, and we're going to do kind of a, a more physical therapy type article, but I'm hoping to do some more nutrition, lots of hypertrophy, strength things. I'm open to whatever. Like I also think using it as an opportunity to get some one-on-one -on -one kind of mentoring from myself because I'll, I'll we'll hop on a Skype just like this and we'll go over it and be like, all right, here, here, what do you think before we ever go live? Like I, my goal is not ever to you know embarrass anybody. I just want to kind of disseminate best practices and and hopefully like I learn too. So you know. That always helps. Man, that's very, very exciting. And I'm going to join myself because I want to, uh, yeah, see what you guys are doing and uh, keep up to date. I think it's a great opportunity to learn uh, as well as, yeah, just find out how things work on the other side of the fence, so to speak. It, it kind of feels that way when you're in the trenches, you're working on the gym floor and very busy with clients. I think it's sometimes good to see what happens on the other side and how we can better bridge the gap uh, between the science and uh, its application. So guys, I highly recommend you check it out. And Brandon, what else is uh, planned for you in the coming months? Only a couple left for 2019. Anything uh, you've got in the bank that you're going to surprise us with? Or yeah. is everything sort of set for 2020? Um, so we got a couple papers accepted that'll be coming out um and i mean i could just kind of tell you a brief outline not tell you the, the, the good parts um but i did a sex differences meta-analysis based on greg knuckles work with him and and james krieger that got accepted should be coming out um probably before 2020 hopefully i um and you know we kind of just found that uh hypertrophy men and women on the same program have the same relative hypertrophy um, strength, a little bit different. So interested to see kind of more research on that. Um, lower body strength seemed to be you know, same relative differences. Upper body strength, I think there was something there that was trying to show. Uh, so that's kind of what the paper is based around. And then uh, we also had a very, very, very large review um, that I did with um, – how Dr. Helms, uh, Dr. Trexler, Peter Fitchin, Dr. Peter Fitchin, and I think that was it on kind of competition and physique athletes. Um, and that is sort of an update on the 2014 nutritional recommendations study that Helms led. Um, so that'll be coming out, but there, like it's it's going to be probably the biggest paper that I've, I've ever been a part of um, in terms of just like this thirteen thousand words or something crazy. But it's, it'll be open access, so that'll be nice. So you, you know you don't have to pay for a subscription to, to read it. Um, and so just kind of be on the lookout for those two things for the most part. I got some other projects doing, but th that's probably the the next two that'll be out. Awesome. Are you able to share some insights into? those other projects you've got in the mix or are they uh, top secret hush hush um so the rest no, of them I don't yeah, want to get we'll, you in we'll trouble hold off on that because <laughs> yeah yeah my, my my collaborators might be like what are you doing <laughs> um but no it's it's nothing like super super exciting it's just me setting up studies and analyzing some data um so anyway yeah that's that's kind of it i'm just doing my i got a couple athletes and you know lecturing on lots of different topics here at the university um submitting some grants uh yeah just living the dream man 
Awesome, awesome. It sounds like it, Brandon. And again, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure listeners took a lot from this one. Hopefully their understanding of muscle physiology and its application to training and how we should go about training to build size from our discussion and the teaser, I guess, on uh, response heterogeneity. So they can, uh, yeah, check out the mentorship if they want to learn more about that. And where else can folks go, Brandon, to see your work, to be a part of the exercise and nutrition journal club and all those sorts of things? Yeah, for sure. The uh, So Facebook is probably, I'm kind of moving more towards Twitter, or sorry, Instagram now, but Facebook, if you just put in Brandon Roberts, um, it should pop right up. And, and you you can kind of go through my timeline. Uh, the Nutrition Club is it's like Exercise and Nutrition Journal Club, and I don't think there's another group named that, so that should be an easy uh, find. Uh, on Twitter, or sorry, Instagram, it's brob21. Uh, I've been doing quite a bit of kind of the, the infographs and then some images, kind of a mix of everything. Also, I put my, my two Huskies up there, so you get to see their pretty faces. Um, and then I have, you know, the strength guys, of course, where I coach and kind of do the education aspect. Uh, and then personal website, I have a lot of different links. Um, so it's uh, fitnessandphysiology.com. And then I have a media blog that I just started because I was like, sometimes I just need to write, <laughs> you know, and not worry about getting it up on a website or worrying about, you know, making it perfect for somebody. I just need to get it out there. Awesome, man. I'll make sure I link all of that in the description box below to uh, save you a little bit of time and uh, make sure that the listeners <laughs> can find you uh, at the click of a button. Brandon, thank you again for coming on, man. It was a pleasure, and hopefully we'll have you back on shortly uh, to chat soon. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Jake. I appreciate it. My pleasure.